Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Peter Case. He's going to share a story about meeting Bob Dylan. Uh, just briefly, I'll say that I met him at T-Bone's birthday party in, in uh, it's either 85 or maybe or something like that. I'm in a room drinking. There's like this big party going on. Newark's there singing, and like everybody's, you know, Newark wasn't drinking, but I was, and we're all hanging out there, and uh, I'm in the kitchen, you know, shooting my mouth off, drinking a beer, and then T-Bone comes in. Hey, Peter. Come with me, man. I got somebody I want you to meet. So I follow him up to the front alcove of his house. It was like over in, like, you know, Santa Monica or something. We go to the front of his house, and in the dark, there's this guy standing there in the dark, you know. He goes, Peter, Bob, Bob, Peter, and then he leaves. <laughs> so that's how I met Bob Dylan. We talked for a couple of minutes, and uh, we, had, we, know, we knew somebody in common. But I did say something really stupid. The first thing I said was, and I said it on purpose just to get it over with, but like, um, like I'd been at this recording session for, I don't know if you know the group um, Shalimar. You do? And they had a record called Dead Giveaway. And I was at one of the sessions because there's this guy from Buffalo named Joey Gallo that was one of the producers on that. And so I was there at one of the sessions that Shalimar did. And when, you, when I went into the hallway, the band called The Silvers, they were like a huge, huge group, but they were songwriters. And they all come up and they go, hey, man, what group are you in? Like they're hanging out in the hallway of the studio, right? I go, I'm in the Plimsolls. They go, oh, love your work, man. Love your work. And they, they, you know, we should write something, man. Let's write something, you know? And so I said to Bob Dylan, I said, you know, oh, I love your work, man. You know, and it, and it seemed like a stupid thing, but he just like shrugged it off. And then he'd been at some movie and he was with a friend uh, of ours. So I said, you know, so we just had a conversation about her and about some a couple of things. I mean, you know. Was it awkward at all? It was mind boggling, you know, you know, in a way. Because he's so famous, you know. I, I can't imagine what that's like. But he just came into the party, you know, and New Earth was there and they were just like, you know, hanging out. And like, hey, man, you know, it was just a big party, you know. So it wasn't that awkward. I mean, I didn't have a lot to say to him, you know, but... I don't really like meeting uh, people that much, you know, uh, particularly. I, I'd rather not meet people generally. Uh, you know, I like like their work and their way meeting them. It's just, who, I, what do I need to meet Bob Dylan for? He doesn't need to meet me. And I, I like his work, but like, you know, I don't need to, what am I going to like pick his brain? He's already given me his whole brain. So, you know, he doesn't, you know, it's stupid. You know, Doug Somm, I met him, you know, and, and uh you know, those guys were fun to hang around with, and Harry Dean Stanton, and they were fun people, you know. And they were just kind of interesting people, and Harry just liked to pick, you know. And then Doug liked to talk about minor league baseball and, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, weird songs and San Antonio. And I knew a lot about San Antonio because I knew a guy in San Antonio, you know. So I hung out with him, but then, like, one night they call up in the middle of the night. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I had a new baby in the house when I had my first baby, you know. And, uh Hey man, I'm out here with Doug Song, man. We're out at the hotel out there. You know, such come on out, man. We're picking. Doug's, yeah, come on out, man. You know, and I was like, I you know, guys, I can't, you know. I'm like, I'm taking care of a, a, like a little baby right now, you know. You feel like an asshole, but you know, I mean it's like, you know, <laughs> they've been through it, you know. I don't know if Harry had, but Doug had. And, you know, I, I you know, I just did, you know, and so I, knowing all these guys like that, you know, Prime was somebody you could, you know, you you loved him on a real personal level, you know, and and uh, with Bob Dylan, I mean, you know, it's none of my business really. So, I mean, I, you know, I just, I mean, I'm not interested in meeting, you know, Elvis, you know, wasn't somebody I wanted to meet or Elvis Costello for that matter. Or, you know, I just don't, you know, want to. Like the people I like are like just the people I meet, you know. Like, unless, unless I just meet them, you know, but I mean, you know, some, like, you know, people that want to, I don't know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. What did Dylan mean to you at like a young age, um, artistically and just as somebody in your record? Were you like a big Dylan head? Big. He meant everything to me. And so I was like, uh, I mean, I grew up in a house full of music. My sisters are teenagers when I'm three and they're playing rock and roll in the house. I had a, one sister who was like a real talented rock and roll piano player and like jazz piano player. And um, she's like 84 now. And she was great. She still plays. And uh, her name's Phyllis. And she was just like super talented. And, 
you know, played stride piano and all this stuff, you know. And so uh, at like 14, you know, she was like a savant, you know. And then uh, records in the house, you know, I inherited their record collections. I also inherited, uh, um, and I liked a lot of other things too. There was just always music in our house. And so when I was really little, I liked the Kingston Trio. My mom would buy me Kingston Trio records like at the grocery store, you know, after, if I, you know, sometimes, you know, and I got, like, I, I still got the records, you know. My sister came home from college with Joan Bias's first album. But we didn't know about Dylan yet. And then my mother, right at the same time I got into Bob Dylan, my mother, unbeknownst to, neither of us knew the other person was getting into Bob Dylan. My mother came home and she goes, we were driving out and we drove your sister back to college and the song came on the radio over by Ithaca of uh, Miss, this guy, Mr. Tambourine Man, like singing. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. And she went out and bought the Bringing It All Back Home album. This is before The Birds, I think. She brought that home and like it just electrified me. That, that record, so that was the first one I got, bringing it all back home. And then I went nuts for Dylan and there was a Dell paperback called The Bob Dylan Story you could get for like 35 cents, filled with lies. It was just all like the Pinocchio story of Bob Dylan, you know, he ran away from home when he was three and was raised by a street singer and all this crap, you know? And uh, all shit that I actually did. I always joked like Bob Dylan's book is like he goes to New York and goes to the top, goes straight to the top, and I go to California and just hit the bottom, you know. And, uh, you know that's the difference between our, you know, our two books. But but uh, <laughs> middle of winter, must have been sixty five or sixty five. Got some Dylan records. I went and bought the. I went. He had to go into Buffalo to get anything, and so. Somehow we got into Buffalo. I can't remember if I rode in with my parents or took the bus. I must have been too little to take the bus. I went in and I bought the first Bob Dylan album. And that just blew my mind completely. And I learned how to play every, the whole, eventually I played that, it was a set. I could do the whole album, you know. When I got to California, I was like doing like, you know, every song on there about death. When I met Mike Wilhelm from the Charlatans, like that was my set. You know, it's like, oh, you know, see that my grave's kept clean, fixing to die, you know, and all that crap. And uh, and some other ones, too. You know, but um, he was the greatest teacher, you know. Uh, another thing that taught me a lot was the liner notes to uh, that year for Christmas they gave me, Times They Are a Change. I remember going up into my room and reading the liner notes to the, the 11 outline. No, not, I think it's 11 outline epitaphs, it's called. I didn't understand it all. It, I probably still don't understand it all, but it was super heavy, like a super key to life. And it had like so many amazing things in it. I mean, it's just, it's such a refer, a resource, you know, it's got all this, like it's got these, all these lists of like artists, these referencing one poem and, and all this. And it's, it's um, really profound and it's like about Woody and it's about heroes and uh, the way it's written. And the, the notes were just, were just super great. And the record, I mean, is, is unbelievable. And so uh, somebody told me, I think it was uh, Gerf Morlex or something. One of the, this, uh, they saw me like when I was 14, like I was going down the street with a guitar on my back and they asked me what I've been doing. I've been rambling around, you know. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, you know, that kind of shit. And so uh, I was really into that. And, you know, I, and then I got into Mississippi John Hurt, which is sort of slightly disconnected from how I got into Dylan. Um, I, I got a college student turned me on a Mississippi John Hurt. He had to come back from the Southern School, and he, he had like uh, that. Uh, and we went to the library, and they had the um, John Hurt Today record. And then shortly after that, it's a long story, but I, I slowly discovered um, Woody Guthrie, Skip James, and Ramon Jack and Cisco Houston, um, all on a hitchhiking trip in the middle of winter to Boston. And uh, I was going up there, and I saw Lighton Hopkins play live. At a, at my last three bucks. And I also like, you know, you know, try to bong the first time with some girls in Syracuse and like got so sick I had to go to the infirmary and then I got kicked out of the infirmary for giving the address of a girl's dormitory as my address. And then, and then I got caught in a blizzard and then I went into a library and they had those records and the, that's where I heard those records was to get out of a blizzard. I like picked out three, you know, through all the victory at sea and all the other bullshit that they had there, you know, Percy Faith records, I pulled out Cisco Houston, Bad Man Ballad, which is an amazing song. Do you know it? Yeah. And, you know, all I ever did was shoot a deputy down, you know, uh, you know, 99 years on the hard rock pile, you know, could have been worse. I could have got life. 
and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, like their attitude was so hilarious. Very much Jack Elliott's like a dead or alive. And so, um, so their attitude I really love, but I love like the things. And then the Highway 61 record really blew me away, you know. And uh, from then on, you know, I had the Bob Dylan songbook, you know, that black covered one. And uh, I read about him in Hip Creator magazine. There was like, you know, we were talking about that before, I think. Uh, and he was in there too quite often and like things about him, you know. They had a piece in there one time, Mike Bloomfield. The first Dylan record I bought that came out in weird time that I bought, that I bought when it came out was John Wesley Harding. I bought that like the day it came out. That was the first one I really caught up with. And that was sort of the end of the run in a way. Like to me, like what, you know, what they say about, you know, what um, that producer Bob Johnson said is, he really was, um, you know, it was the work of God or something. There was something really heavy. You could learn so much, though, from that songwriting. And I got so much of it into my system. Now, I've got a lot of nursery rhymes in my system, too, and a lot of um, poetry. My mother, like, um, was a Shakespeare nut from college, you know, you know, sort of. She didn't really read it anymore, but she had read it and memorized a lot of it. So he meant a lot to me. And then finally, uh, I wanted to understand the things he understood, and uh, I didn't want to be like him. I wanted to like try to do what he was to to try to go, try to get the things that he was trying to get, you know, in my own way. And uh, and to do that, I had other problems too. I had a crisis in my life. I don't think he necessarily had, which is I I went insane basically when I was about fifteen, and I took a lot of LSD and uh, I had to be reconstituted. And uh, that was very painful, and it was um, it involved it involved making an effort not to go to the mental institution. But I was really, really hurting, and uh, I started reading Blake, as some guy told me. Well, you're 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 you could be like religious people that are religious people or spiritual people. Like you, you, you often they go through the thing like what you're going through, and like you should read Blake. You should read Dwayne Elegies by Rilke because maybe it'll help you. And I read those things and they did help me. And, um, but Dylan helped me. And like, I'm, you know, we're all stuck, sitting here stranded doing our best to deny it. You know, shit like that, you know. And it's like such an honest and heavy line. You know, it's like the heaviest line. It's like fucking Sartre in one sentence, you know. And, uh, you know. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it's heavy. And like I went, you know, all that thought. I mean, I realized I was going to die when I was about three or four. My my parents were Unitarians, so they didn't believe in anything. They just had a question marks. And so, uh, you know, what happens when you die? You know, I'm scared. My father was like, I am too. Well, you know, you don't really want to hear that. The lady next door died that used to give me candy and cookies. And I loved her, Mrs. Valentine. She passed away. She was an old lady. I loved her, though. She loved me. Gave me a lot of, like, attention and love next door, you know. And then she's gone, and there's all these people going up and down her driveway, but she's never coming back, you know. And I, I got up in this room, you know, and I, all of a sudden I'm just, like, supposed to be going to sleep. And I'm like, holy shit, man, we die. What the hell? Where did she go? Well, you know, some people some people think you go, you know, and you just, that's it. And you, you know, it was like no heaven. And, you know, some people think there's a heaven, but, you know, I don't really think there is. My dad didn't think there was, you know. And, uh. So that was the start of like, you know, really that, you know, but then when I, behind the drugs I took, then I was in a lot of pain about it, you know, and I, I, I felt, when I look at Dylan's career, I see that he's really wrestling with that in like his, uh, highway, in, in the, it, like the Highway 61 period and a little bit before that, you know, no death ever stopped the world. He's like, you know, he's saying that everybody he says to the guy, don't look back, which is not a, he's not being mean to the guy. He's talking to the guy in English. An American, he's not being mean to anybody except that time. He's kind of drunk. He's not being mean to Donovan. Donovan has to hear the song. It's so stupid, you know, that people get, you know, all this baby talk about, you know, which is another Dylan line, actually. But, you know, but, you know, he's saying, he's being, he's telling the guy the truth, you know, everybody has to die. And how you deal with that, you know, you know that's like a very compassionate statement, you know. And the guy looks at him and the guy knows it is. And so it's like, you know, People like in this society, they don't, you know, there's a line by Dylan where he says, the, you know, tolling in Chimes of Freedom, tolling for the guardians and protectors of the mind. 
We're living in an era that's a completely materialistic era. There is no mind. It doesn't, dis- it doesn't exist anymore in the culture. Mind is zero. It's all Dylan was, was mind. You know, that's what Ginsburg was, was mind. You know, mind, you know, mind breaths by Gibbs, by, you know, Kerouac, you know, the mind, you know, you know, kind king mind, you know. The mind is what you are, you know, the whole universe exists in your mind. It's it, you know. All this is like, it's all in your fucking mind, you know. If you didn't have a mind, it wouldn't matter if there was like a black hole somewhere. It wouldn't matter if there was a big bang. If you didn't know about it, if nobody knew about it, it wouldn't matter. It's just bullshit. But if there's, if somebody knows about it, then there's a mind. That's all that. That's all there is, and that's why attitude is everything. Everything in life, you know, and all the stuff that they teach you here, the materialism of America, you know, and the Western world, and you know, probably the rest of the world too. It's getting to be. It's like. You know, it's very destructive. We live in a materialistic era. It's going to be the death of us. You know, it, it's all about, really what life's about is about attitude. And it's about kindness. And it's about love, you know. Whether Dylan or not ended up being about that, I, I don't understand him anymore. Like, he's outstripped me. I, I don't, I can't, I don't really know what he's, when he starts getting into the, the Greeks and I'm going to, uh, you know, cut you with a crooked sword and all this kind of shit that he's talking about. I don't, I, you know, I, I, I know that he probably knows things. I, a lot of things I don't know because he's 84 or whatever he is. But it's not the same direction I'm going in anymore. But I sure appreciate what he did. And like, I appreciate what he's doing now because he's, you know, he's taking something all the way. He's going to take touring and singing and songwriting and caring about it all the way. He's taking it all the way. He's, he's not going to like a fucking island in Bimini or something, you know? <laughs>